You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, Gene. Johnson. After from Los Angeles, California, and Maria Menunos, and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies, this is AfterBuzz TV Showrunners. AfterBuzz TV Showrunners is a long-form interview series featuring television showrunners and creators. And now, from the world's number one TV after-show platform, this is AfterBuzz TV Showrunners. Hey guys, I'm Steph Z here with another episode of Showrunners. I'm so, so excited that I have Cara Vallo. Did I say that right? Vallo. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. We've been outside talking for a couple minutes. Um, we've got her executive producer, animator. You've done tons of stuff. We didn't even know what title to put for you because you've done so many fun, interesting things. Um, so there's, there's lots of stuff I want to talk to you about. For me, though, in doing some of my research... One of the things that I want to know, and it's, it might be a left field question, so I figured I'd start right away, is um, I know you did the set design for Pee Wee's Playhouse back in the day. <laughs> I didn't do the set design. That's what they said. No, I worked at, um, when I was out of college, I worked at a, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you, it's not a, really that interesting a story, but I worked at a studio in New York called Broadcast Arts, which was at the time sort of the biggest animation studio around, although it, wasn't that big. Um, they, they, the studio broadcast arts um, was responsible for designing the sets for Pee Wee's Playhouse. That much is correct. Oh. When I started working there, interestingly, they had just, I don't know, if they just had a, some sort of falling out with um, the production. And, um, and again, I'm not, I don't really remember the details, but all the props from the set like um cherry and mm -hmm. terry were on like my desk like were on the shelf <laughs> over my desk like sort of rotting away and it was just sort of it was me exciting to, to me i was a huge fan of that show but very sort of poignant and sad and i i much i think there was maybe a lawsuit or something going on i'm not again i was an assistant there and i'm not really sure um the details of it but those those props were there. Those iconic props were there. Like so. So my million dollar question, which I, th <laughs> I think th I think the answer is going to be no. Now yeah. is, did you get to ride his bike? No, we didn't have the bike. Oh! We were sort of the sad, this, it the was sad like, remnants. Man, of the, my start. Like I thought it was going to go a totally different way. But all right. You know, Steph, <laughs> if I had created the set design for Pee Playhouse, that would be my title under my name. That you're. Yes. That would be number one. Yeah, because that's just amazing. <laughs> and I was like, when I when I was reading all like the wiki stuff and whatever, like I swear that's the way that it says mm -hmm. it in there. And um, I was just like, did she get to ride the bike? <laughs> That'd be funny. It also says on the internet I was once married to Umberto Echo, who's I wasn't an, gonna go there, but it said like three months. And you know what? It's <laughs> it was the first thing that ever popped up on the on the internet when the internet was in its infancy. And I have no idea where it came from. It's still there in a lot of like Italian it's um, there language wiki. things. Yeah, I'm not. I, wiki I, needs I, to be changed. I am. Com I am, just. Completely ignorant of how that came about. I think it's kind of cool, but that's kind of funny. Well, I guess that's why we kind of do interviews like this, so we yeah. can figure out set what's the truth. record straight. Yeah, we can yeah. set the record straight. <laughs> Man, those are two cool things that I wish were true. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can figure out how to get that bike one day for you. <laughs> well, we'll go ride around on the beach or something. Um, so tell me, you know, your your early days. You went to school of visual arts in New York, mm -hmm. and at, at that point was like animation and drawing was kind of more like you were saying in its infancy stage. Like it was like, did you ever think that it could? be where it is today like was that a hope a dream or was it kind of like oh this is cool I'm just gonna major in this um actually I it was always my intention um to work in animation that specific medium was what I was interested in I um I didn't foresee uh you know that there would be the Simpsons or there would be 
a huge um, market for television animation, but I didn't ever, you know, consider that I wouldn't be able to make some sort of living doing it. I, you know, there were, at the time, there were a few commercial houses in New York, and I, you know, I lived there for about 10 years, and, um, you know, they taught it to us at School of Visual Arts as if it were right. a trade. <laughs> it was a very small department, um, and there were, you know, some graduates who were working in animation. It was, you know, primarily in commercials that um, incorporated some animation, and um, Broadcast Arts, the studio that I first worked at, was had had the most work going on, but they didn't have anything um, episodic or right. you know it was mostly television commercials and design for things and interstitials and right. and at that time were they still were you still, like hand drawing stuff still or yeah, yeah right hand drawing was, stuff still actually are you that was yeah. like really oh I love it I went to school I have a degree in design and photography and I was like one of the last people to move over to the digital camera so I like that but you still draw your designs on paper right yeah. I do. I don't know. Why. Like, I mean, most people. I mean, do, I can right? do it on Photoshop, and sometimes, like, you know, tweaks and stuff happen. You know what I mean for for design. But I feel I don't know. I just I I like to write things down. I like still to have my calendar book. You know what um, I mean? I have a, like, I have one of those desk calendars. Oh yeah, and you just write in stuff like a square. Yeah. yeah, but you, you you're a very visual person, so I think that you know, like having a calendar in I'm your phone. I'm an old person, so I'm used to old is relative. <laughs> Come on. I need to have something tactile, or and I'm right. also ADD, so I if it's not in front of me, it doesn't exist. If I can't see it, yeah, I use my iCal obviously, and I use my device. Yeah, like I do use them, but it has to be out there. If something's shut away in a drawer; it doesn't exist. Right. So yeah. even now, and we'll we'll jump later in the interview to, to Cosmos and, and the amazing things that are happening there. But e so even for that, you still sketch with pen and paper. Mm -hmm. really? But yeah, so when you design, like when designers design clothing, they don't they sketch it. A lot of them are doing it on like like a tablet now. Oh, really? You know what I mean? Like they have like even you'll see on like the Project Runways and stuff like we talk about. They have the tablets and they're like sketching them on there. And I know right. it's like a promotional thing that. Right. They have the tablets on the show now, but I feel like, right. I mean, even I've, I've seen and with some of my friends at Direct, like they're breaking down scripts on iPads and so like everything's kind of right. changing yeah. a little bit. And I, I don't yeah, know that well, I like on, it. On, on the television shows, on Family Guy and American Dad and the Cleveland Show, we had, um, everyone was drawing on actual paper, storyboard paper, maybe up to maybe five or six years ago. Um, and at some point, I was like, all right, we really should, you know, transition over to, to, to Wacom tablets and, right. and, and a digital system, yeah, that's... And, which we did, you know, it's, you know, saves paper, saves a lot of revision time, and it was a bit of a transition for, you know, right. three or four hundred artists that had, you know, every, our, animation's an arcane process, it's still, you have to draw every every single piece of movement. It yeah. doesn't. It's not spit out of a computer like some people think, um, which is awesome. It's like back to the mm -hmm. flip book. It's yeah, it is. I mean, it is in essence. It's it's it. it the, the problem with it, it's extremely time consuming and right. expensive. But um, there, you know, the artists were able to, you know, to adapt to the digital right. system and drawing digitally and you know it's it has saved us an enormous amount of time and um but there's there's still some people that draw right um drawn paper first and did you guys save all those paper drawings oh, God, you know it would it would be I like a warehouse ever. and yeah the size of uh, you just throw them away when you're done they recycled oh we recycled good there you go you know, we we some, I but it, you know it was there's so much. There was so much of it. Right. It's right. So, so in like when you were at school visual arts stuff, what was the thing about animation that kind of just you know, for lack of a better word, drew you in? Um, I think that before, I think my love of animation as a genre was happened long before. Um, I was in school I, as a child. I loved cartoons, like most right. people, and um. My grandfather was a little bit of a, um, a little bit of an art. He was an engineer, but he was an artist on the side and loved cartoons. And there was something about 
having the ability to imagine something and then see it come to life, which just seemed like insanely crazy and great to me. And, you know, not having that ability at, when I was considering it and talking to my grandfather about it, like just seemed like amazing. I could think of some sort of chimeric character out of my imagination and then somehow make it real. Um, awesome. And I studied, you know, when I went to art school, I, you know, I, was in and out of a lot of different um, programs and tinkered in a lot of different things and didn't right. take that much <coughs> seriously. But um, with, towards the end of towards the end of my tenure at school, I, I really made a decision to that I wanted to try to pursue some sort of career in animation. Um, so I didn't, you know, there were a lot of people, especially out here in Hollywood, that sort of happened into it. It became uh, you know, an industry right. that was sort of viable and um, moved from live action television into it, but that wasn't me. Um, I don't have a lot of interest in other, in live forms of entertainment. It's still like the medium that I have always loved and um, not the, right. the television itself. Right. Well, that that's that's interesting. I like that. So, so pretty. So one of your earlier one of your earlier jobs. Mm -hmm. And which led to this Family Guy run that's an amazing, amazing run. It's been a, 10 years, has it been? Or our 12th, 12th season. 12th season, yeah. yeah, which is crazy. One of your first shows was Dilbert, correct? Um, yeah, I had done a, quite a few children's television series before that. Um, Dilbert was the first primetime like, adult animated right. show that I worked on. I was working um, over at Sony on kids show I think it was Men in Black or something and um, it was the UPN network at the time wanted to do a prime time animated show it was when The Simpsons was in its heyday right and a lot of different networks were trying trying that out and um, so I worked on Dilbert for I think it went two seasons right um, it was a you know it's a great experience it was an odd show but it right. was uh, um, have you ever seen it I have was, back in the day. Yeah. yeah, I like the character drawing too. I don't yeah. know why. It's just it's different. Yeah, 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 it's different. And you know, I, I've always had a, I've always been a sucker for like office comedy. Like, right. Just put a like drawing of like a, post it on a computer, and it, I think it's hilarious. Right. <laughs> um. So I, I, I like that aspect of it. I was not a big fan Dilbert comic strip fan, but I thought, right. I thought the show was interesting. It was, um, um, you know. It was, yeah, it was very different. You know, right. it, didn't, it was hard at that time for networks to sustain um, pride. You know, yeah, it's very expensive, and it's a huge commitment for networks. Right, well, see, that's something, I mean, I get the, the time that you're saying is involved mm -hmm. to create this stuff, but for mm -hmm. me, like, or, or maybe, like, the average viewer might think that shows like that or a family guy and stuff like that is actually cheaper because there's not talent. There's not actors that you have to pay to be there, well, but you're creating and the voices, you know, like I get the actors and the voiceovers and, and stuff like that exists, but from right. the outside, I would think that it's a, you know, less budget is needed for a production like that. Um, well, I mean, the, there is, there's talent on, when you talk about the successful shows, obviously, you know, The Simpsons cast makes a lot of money. Um, as and, much as actors would? Oh, yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Yes. They, I mean, they're um, you know, can't do the show without them. And, right. Um, you know, at the onset of a show, the actors don't make that much. But if the show's successful, they, yeah, you know, as they ought to. Um, but you know, it, the the structure of those prime time animated shows is very similar to a live action animated show. We they have big writing staffs. Um, so above the line is you know always. Expensive. I mean, and in a show like Family Guy that um, is so joke heavy, and you know, you need so much comedy in such a short time. You need a lot of yeah voices, and um, and then you know, beyond that, it's there are just hundreds of hands involved in getting the show on the air. You know, there are right. hundreds of artists here, and then we have studios in Korea that do like the in betweening part of the animation and and the 
um, digital ink and paint, and then we have post production. You know, it's just a huge, it's a huge process. It's not like it's so interesting. And to it's me, there's so many things that you would never like. Even just hearing you say this, you would never think it goes overseas to be like colored in and use process. You know what I mean? Like it's just it's like I get yeah. it. Like any other business, people you know do that kind of stuff. But for me, like it's just so interesting to me. Yeah. Um. So, so in your early stages is, you know, between the, that's when you met Seth and you guys like, t can you tell me about that a little bit? Like how this whole family guy came to creation and the mm -hmm. cancellation, the reboot, Fox saying you would, guys would never really like this <laughs> style of animation would never go forward. And you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's a journey there. Yeah. I mean, there was it. Um, I met, first met Seth. We both were working at, um, for a Cartoon Network at a studio that was then Hanna-Barbera um, in Studio City. We were both working on a show called Johnny Bravo. Um, and we, um, we became friendly on the show, but, you know, partially because neither of us really had, like, had, he had just moved to Los Angeles and he was very young. And we just worked all the time. like. I, you know, I had crap going on in my life, and he was, we, we spent a lot of time at work. And um, uh, so we, we, we became very friendly, and when that, when that show was sort of petering out, um, Seth was, uh, cr you know, creating some wacky thing in his office, which I would come in and, and take a look at. And it became Family Guy, was, uh, these sh shorts that he... Uh, was working on, and he, um, you know, I wouldn't say he lucked out, but he had, like, a stroke of luck in that it got, Fox um, caught wind of it and um, saw something in it that they thought was marketable, and, um, you know, there were some days at, evenings at Hanna-Barbera where we were, like, painting cells, mm -hmm. um, which was the old way you did it on a piece of celluloid, um, for what became Family Guy. And, um, he, so he, I, the show, you know, I, I, at the time the show initially got picked up, I was, um, um, contracted over at Sony. I was working on Dilbert at the time. So I wasn't there from the, for the f for pre first cancellation seasons. Um, but I came on board, it, the show was canceled briefly and then it came back third season and um that's when i came in board and then it got really canceled right um and it was off for a couple two years i guess right that's pretty interesting because i have a quote here that all right i think i do um about how fox you know pretty much was like there will never be animation like this again and then like cut to a couple of years later you're kind of responsible for three it's, half yeah. hours of animation like that on fox on sunday night which is kind of the night that like the last night to decompress right. before the week starts it's the big, like it's, it's an big important night. night it is the big night yeah i mean i remember um after we'd gotten canceled the third season and we were packing up the stuff and um i remember asking one of our executives at Fox, well, how do you want me to archive the show? Because usually you'd, you'd have a box for each episode and you'd put the models and just, you know, just, right. it's just a matter of course. I've done it for every show that's gotten canceled. And then they archive it somewhere. Um, they were like, you don't bother. And, you know, and yes, it was said to me, we, Fox will never be in the business of doing primetime animation. And Simpsons was still on. Right. And doing very well. Um, you know, we had, and we had had hundreds of, animation desks which at the time you had to have specially built which we gave away and um i did end up archiving um just doing it anyway because it just felt so bizarre not to do it but um i don't think they were actually well i know they weren't actually put anywhere because then when you know the show got picked up again because um cartoon network expressed an interest in doing new episodes and um mike lazo who was around adult swim at the time and seth and i had worked with at hanna barbera saw a great value in it i mean it was funny because there was you know it had never garnered good ratings and um but during its um 
during its cancellation period, I'd go with Seth to some, um, like right when they started putting out, decide to put out DVDs, which is sort of an afterthought. Um, we'd go to some events, like at like a bar near UCLA or something, and do, he would do like an appearance where they would give away the DVDs and he'd sign them. And there would be lines around the block of these dudes. Yeah. And it was always like, it seemed like there was something going on, but it wasn't quantified in any way in terms of ratings. But they're just, oh, and it was, you know, prior to inter the internet really, and there wasn't enough, there, you couldn't really point your finger at any buzz or any interest or any audience. But, but when the, you know, the DVDs just sold like crazy, um, and it was around the same time that um, Cartoon Network was interested in doing original episodes. I think I contacted Fox about it, and then, you know, Fox saw it the money that was being made on the DVDs and the, um, um, the demand and then, you know, made this decision. Oh, well, we're going to pick it up. Right. It was kind of like a fear of loss decision. I, I think partially. Yeah. yeah. You know, which happens. Ha you know, some yeah. It's like, get, like, oh, I don't want up. that. And somebody else wants it. Like, Wait a minute. Yeah. I want that. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, and then they picked, you know, their order was, not 22 episodes, 35 episodes, which I never yeah. even heard of before. So, I mean, it just seemed, you know, Extreme. Yeah, I mean, from, you know, from nothing to suddenly, like, an order that was inordinately right. high. And so, so can you tell me a little about, so, so being the executive producer for Family Guy, like, I'm sure that means you wear a bazillion hats. You probably don't sleep much. Like, is there, like, what is that, I mean, like, I know it would take forever to s break down exactly what happens, but mm -hmm. what is, like, the process, like, you create the space, then the characters, or maybe coming into Family Guy that was already determined because you had come on once it started, you know what I mean? But, like, in stuff like this, is it, like, you, you, you get a character first, mm -hmm. and you get his storyline, and then you build around him, or do you have this message, and then you build <laughs> the characters into it, or does it change all the time, or how does that... <laughs> um, well, the, I'm not involved in the writing process. There are show, there are the technical showrunners, Steve Callahan and Rich Appel, run the writer's room. Okay. And what happens is, I mean, I, um, I came on before anyone else came on after the show came back because we needed to build an infrastructure and hire, you know, the writers and the artists and everything, um, to do all that. Um, but my initial job was to, um, you know, cre just create a studio and create a pipeline to be able to do the show. And at the same time that Family Guy was getting picked up, I had produced a pilot called American Dad, which was um, mm -hmm. a show that Seth was creating um, because Family Guy was gone. And at the same time, they decided to pick up both those series. So, um, you know, it was building, you know, Base, building this entity that could facilitate having those shows run through a system, um, you know, at the time it was Family Guy it was this 35 episode order, and they only you know, networks and studios order a season at a time, so you can't really anticipate. Oh, we're going to be here for 10 years. We should buy a building, or we should do it this way. Everything's always like season to season. Oh wow, that must play too for the story. <laughs> like you don't know if you can leave a cliffhanger, right? And because you shows... don't want to leave fans cliffhanged forever, you right? Know? Right? Yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's all and it's always season to season. Like we would never know, even on Family Guy, for right. sure, if we were getting picked up. But um, but what happens is the the writers will um, you know, communally in a room, um, pitch story ideas. You know, well, it'll be, you know, Brian getting hit by a car or whatever, and then a B story, and they'll, um, they'll flesh those out into scripts, and then the first thing, um, then the, f the next thing they do is um, we record the voice actors, um, because the entire animation, physical animation process uh, starts at getting the audio track. Oh, wow. The artists, like the storyboard artists will take the audio track and then they start doing a storyboard based on the um the lines that the characters are saying and at the you know at the same time we have designers who are designing the characters and um you know and then it just becomes an assembly line more or less right of um of tasks and 
um, the 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 main goal of the um, you know animation production team is to create a like a flawless package that can be sent to our artists in in Seoul, Korea, to create exactly what we want. So it involves like a you know very explicit um, set of drawings of motions like nothing is left up to anyone's imagination we create something called exposure sheets where the actual audio is exposed through a bizarre phonetic system wow. on each individual frame and half a frame so when the animators overseas have them they don't they're not making anything up they're following it on a guide and um and then it's sent you know they have it for like you know, 13, 14 weeks and right. send it back. And then we have a post-production process. There's a rewrite, you know, we do a screening and there's a rewrite and then we edit and yeah. do revisions back overseas. And, and then, you know, the post, then the post process is pretty similar to any live action one in terms of online and do a sound mix. And we do on the shows, um, we do live scores because Seth is very um, musical. <laughs> so we do like orchestra scores for the yeah. animated shows on the Fox lot with a huge orchestra. It's kind of funny. All the my my shoes. one my one um, experience of Seth is uh, I, I was at this place called Sardo's. You oh, know, I've so, been to Sardo's with him. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I was there about like ten years ago, and one of my friends was such a huge fan, and I, I think it was kind of maybe even longer than that now because it was kind of maybe where it was like the show might not get picked up type thing, mm -hmm. and he was so. And this is a friend of mine who is so not the guy that's starstruck ever, and he was like will you go ask if I could take a picture with him? Like, he was sitting at this thing, like, karaoke uh -huh. Like, it was so funny. So I get that he That's likes so the funny. music thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that place was a real crap hole. With Sardo, it's like a hole in the wall. Yeah. I've been there tons of times. Yeah. I love it. It's kind of fun, though. Yeah. It's still there? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. I haven't been probably in, like, a good year. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure it's still there. Yeah, Seth is very, he's very musically talented. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, so for me too, with Family Guy on one hand, and then newer projects you're doing like Cosmos, the, the common thing for me, the, the thing that I find fascinating is, I feel like with animation, you can kind of get away with more than with live action. More in like, the way of... You can push the envelope more. Oh, definitely. You know, and why Why do you think that is? Like, why can you... I mean, like, I was just watching some Family Guy episodes before I came in just to, like, freshen up some stuff. And, like, I was watching the one with the vasectomy. I don't know if you remember that one. And it's like the... They come in and, like, some of the things they say are so outrageous. Right. And it's like if there was regular actors, you know, humans, I guess, right. saying that, it would so not fly. Well, I think it's, I mean... If you think of like, if it was on Saturday Night Live, where some, something is so entrenched in parody of something, right. then you can get away with it. And I think that's pretty much what, I think that one of Seth's geniuses is his ability to take something that otherwise would be just, you know, untenably offensive. And, right. and make it a parody and make it smart enough that it's not, it, people aren't like killing themselves over it, like right. The they AIDS can say the intention. Critic. It's just yeah, yeah. There, there's something his about his ability to twist things like that, that you know, that allows and you know, part of it is a product that this show is very successful, so we get away with a lot. Right, right, right. Um, you know, there's a lot of things um in the, both those shows that we don't get away with that um live action shows get away with mostly sex related because there's he, something people are still in that mindset of it's a cartoon it's children so so there are as, as, because you might get away with some things on one side there's some other things that you guys know yeah. don't touch yeah there's like uh, okay. we, like we have a hard and fast rule from standards and practices that if you see like an animated buttocks and on our shows it's like two lines it's like a couple pencil lines we're not allowed to show the indentation like oh, of the, really? but yeah, in any way, like even if it's like stew, stewy, like a baby, it's obscene to them for some reason. And you know, I've had many arguments about that line. 
And, you know, some things, you know, and, and, and television, live action television has gotten much looter um, right. through the years. And um, I just would say, I mean, if you flip flop it to some, like, you can't see that one line, but like the violence and stuff that's on television today, you think that it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Violence is never an issue. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just people, it's, you know, it's the puritanical sex problem and people don't seem to be that as outraged about violence i mean i f i find it you know to be i mean I, some of that stuff is untenable for me like right i mean like game of thrones like it's too violent for me i don't right. want to see people slaughtered yeah i don't want to see it and you would think too that in in cartoon it would be different but it's still like the slaughter is the slaughter yeah i mean we we don't do when we do extreme violence on like Family Guy or American Dad, it's always extremely cartoony. So right. it's not, you know, the head's going to be back Pop on off. the head. Right, right, know, right. On the body, the next scene. And, um, but there are things like, I don't know if you watched the episode um, a couple seasons ago where Brian and Stewie are locked in the bank vault. It's just them, like the whole episode? Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. there is a, a scene in that episode where, Stu so disgusting, but Stewie... <laughs> You know, craps his diaper and it's stinking up the place and they're stuck in there and Stewie convinces Brian that and there's he doesn't have another diaper that he's gonna get diaper or whatever, so Brian has to eat the poop out of his diaper. <laughs> and it's like we had to go back and forth many times, like the sound effects were re were really gross and we finally I think landed where we could have very little slurping sound effects on it, but it was it was like it would make it actually was so disgusting. It made me feel a little bit queasy. Yeah, you know, and that's the stuff like we will always get notes on like that slurping poop sound is too gross. Is there ever like um so so is the process? Do they have to like approve? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So there's an approval. It won't be mm -hmm. like, you'll get notes before it's aired. There, yeah, they, was there ever yeah. something that was aired that after, there was an afterthought of like, yeah, that was a step too far? There have been a couple instances where those parent groups have complained about <laughs> some things. I have no idea what you're talking about. Because <laughs> they don't really exist. They're like addresses at like cemeteries and garbage dumps. Right. They mail these letters from. But there were a couple instances where... We produced entire shows right. that then they're like, oh, wait a second. We can't air that. Um, one of them was we did an episode where Lois has an abortion and, you know, it goes through the whole process. And it was something that was discussed. And Seth took a lot of notes from the network and the studio about how to portray it. And um, so it was perfectly reasonable right. episode and didn't advocate anything and but at the last minute, they decided they couldn't air it. Um, and there was, oh, there was an instance of one of the, I think in season three, an episode um, where Peter hires a Jewish t a tax attorney or whatever, and he sings this song, a Disney song about a Jew. And at the last, you know, they produced the whole show and then they didn't air that. And then it got leaked online, and they, I was they gonna eventually say, I feel like it. I've seen something yeah. like that. Yeah, seen both. I mean, the then what they did with uh, Lois' abortion episode is they released it on DVD later, and you know, it's yeah, made money off it that way. So. Right, right, yeah. Well, and, and that, and now bringing, um, you know, bringing around to Cosmos, I, I feel like yet again we're pushing the envelope slightly not not really pushing the envelope but when you in my mind when you deal with science and and exploring science it shouldn't be pushing the envelope it right? shouldn't be but there's a lot of people that are so you know like you're gonna get really mixed reviews i think not mixed reviews but there are a lot of people that won't even tr be open to take it in they're just yeah. like no it, it can't be that way you know they're set in their ways and stuff so i yeah. feel like you know adding um, the element of animation makes it different to watch. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the the animated portions of the show are the narrative portions of the show, which um, are basically historical recreations of events that took, I mean, we're not showing, um, you know, it, it's, you know, Giordano, Giordano Bruno's life. And um, most of the... Um, 
I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. Like, I mean, there were a lot of angry. Um, Seth was showing me a lot of angry tweets and stuff from. Yeah, I saw some. There were, it's, and I'm not sure what exactly they were. They were. They were taking offense to, I mean, maybe the well, creature was, coming out of the primordial ooze. Yeah, there was no, from what I saw, there was no specific thing that pissed people off. Some people were just kind of like, hmm. But, but you guys got great reviews. Yeah. And just, just take a step back. So, so how did this happen? Like, here you guys are, a, a team of people that are producing and creating these shows like Family Guy, American Dad, The Cleveland Show, you know what I mean? Like shows that are humorous. And, and then it's like, wait. We want to, you know, use what we've created to get this science thing out. Like, how did that happen? Well, that was, I mean, that was Seth completely on his own. He had um, met Androyan, who's Carl Sagan's widow, um, who had been trying to do, a, like, a resurrection of the show for quite a number of years. And he met her, and it was on the Bill Maher show, maybe. I, I'm not sure where he met her, and... And he had also met Neil Tyson, who he was a fan of. And um, so Seth sort of had the idea of getting them together and um, then had, you know, the big idea of pitching it to Fox Broadcasting as something they might want to do. I think Anne and her partner Mitchell had been pitching it around. I don't think Fox was on their radar as, some, as right. a network that would be interested in it. Um, but you know, Seth is, you know, has his shows there and, um, he talked to the head of the network about it, um, who was very open to doing something like that and kind of got that ball rolling. And, um, I, he had an outside team because the show primarily is not animated and it's something completely right. different. And. Seth's um, other producer, Jason Clark, who produces his live action movies, was producing it. And, you know, in the original 1980 series, the, the historical recreations were done live action with actors. And um, I don't think anyone thought that that was really going to translate today. It seemed kind of hokey. Right. Um, so Seth had the idea to do those in animation. Um, so you know, talk to me about it. I, I initially, like, had did not have an interest in doing it, um, um, primarily because the original series still is, like, hugely important. It was hugely important to my life and everyone in my family's life. It's sort of, people of my generation, it's like a mythic memory, the Carl Sagan's Cosmos. And I didn't understand the animation. Right. I didn't under, I didn't think I could do the material justice. Mm -hmm. um, but um, he asked me to go to have drinks with Anne, and um, she was able to convince me that she twisted your arm. <laughs> yeah, but in the, in her way, she's very she's a brilliant person, and right, she's sort of Carl's voice in a lot of ways, and um, it was so it, she made it sort of irresistible because what she was asking for there really wasn't another. Um, genre that could have done it except animation. It was really the only, right. the only possible yeah. hope for what she was for for what she wanted to do. So yeah. I did. I actually got to see a clip um, about with her speaking about that mm -hmm. and saying she said you know something to the effect that it was specifically designed to get people's interest through visuals. So like mm -hmm. and of what Neil was saying too, a clip that I saw of him was that you know and and Seth too. They all kind of alluded to this that even if you weren't really interested on the science of it, they wanted it to be like visually so awesome that you wanted to watch right. it and like right. you would get this message like subliminal almost. Right, yeah, no, totally. I mean, I think it's, there, a lot of time has passed since the original series and which was much more simply produced and Carl sitting on a rock and the sound of his voice mm -hmm. was, a, was um, enough to engage, you know, it was huge. Everyone yeah. watched it. Right. But, you know, our audiences are different now. Um, they have higher expectations for entertainment, lower attention spans, lower literacy levels, of right. particularly science. So you, it, 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 you know, it, it, you have to up the game. You have to, in order to engage people, it just has to be something different. Yeah.
Well, I think one thing uh, that you guys did very well to up the game was get uh, President Obama to introduce the show. How'd that yeah, happen? Yeah, you know what? I'm actually not sure because the Cosmos team went to the White House and I wasn't invited. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I think that it must have... Um, they were there for that film festival thing and um, they showed him the premiere episode there. So... Right. I'm not sure if it was ne who who actually initiated it. So it was a, actually a surprise to me a couple of days before the broadcast that he was going to do that. So it was pretty. Uh, like I was, was like, cool. "What's happening in the world?" I'm like, "I'm right. sitting here. I'm like, I'm going to watch Cosmos. Uh -huh. Like, I get to meet you. Uh -huh. I get to tell you. I'm like, let me watch this. And I'm like, wait, did something blow up? Did something happen? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you, all of a sudden right. you just get the him. Commander like, in chief. Right. Yeah. I was like, uh oh. But that was kind of. Uh, I know. It was pretty cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And what he had yeah. to say was really interesting too. You know, like he was just, he was encouraging people to explore and to to question things. And to me, like right. I'm a big. Like, I, I'm like Curious George. Like, I like to question everything. I'm like, but why? Yeah. But why'd that happen? Right. You're like a five-year-old, you mean. Yeah, I am, kind <laughs> of. I think I, I like it, too. Yeah, I mean, I wish he would, you know, put some more funding into <laughs> space research and stuff. I mean, I think that... Um, do you think that that conversation was had when they were there? Or do you think it was more, like... I don't think... I doubt you it. You don't think it crossed over yeah, like that? Yeah, I think it was more, you know... This is the show we're, we're doing. Yeah, and, we're guests of the White House, kind of. Maybe not try to push our agendas on you. I mean, <laughs> you know, how many times do they get to go? Are you there? You might no, as I well. know. I mean, maybe Neil, Neil would have been the only one probably who would have had the, mm. the guts to do that. But. You think he'll ever have Neil be a voice on The Family Guy? Um, I would have, yeah, he has been a voice. Oh, him. he has and been already? we would oh, use him any, that. yeah, any He's got time. such a good voice. He has such a good Like voice. how we were talking earlier, like, it's kind of to me like a Star Wars-y, like Obi-Wan. right. Like it's a very It's big but it's, it's warm and it's, it's intelligent. You don't yeah. question it. You're like, Okay, he said so. Cool. No, I know. Seth said when like in his first meeting with him they had they had lunch and you know, uh afterwards Seth was like, I think I just met Jesus. Yeah. Because he knows everything. <laughs> he just knows everything. And it's just I mean I'm in But awe he doesn't come off like, like a know it all at all though. No, and but he, the, he's a no he is a know it all and he well, he loves to explain things. Um, he doesn't ever seem to tire of it. But it's never, you never get the feeling he's a know-it-all because he does know it all. And he's, you know, he's so passionate about everything that he's talking about. It's That's kind of awesome. Yeah, I'm so a little bit in awe of him. Yeah, I think too, as we talk about Cosmos, I think, uh, Marissa, I think we have some pictures up here of you and your team. Um, do you have those pictures? Yes, one sec. Okay. Um, and, and again, like, for me, I think, you know, it's almost like you're the coach, in a way, of a team. Like, you kind of... coach, yeah. Like, you tell everyone... You, you keep <laughs> the whole team in line. And um, I just, you know, I would love for you to kind of, like, walk us through once we get the picture. Yeah, like, what... Like what? What's going on there? Yeah, like, what's going on? Um, like, who okay. are those people? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, when Seth, you know came to me and said he wanted to do um, do these narrative sequence animation. And I, and I was like, well, what are you talking about? What? How? What? And he, I remember he had to leave for like England that, that night or something. So I got very little feedback as to what, I think it was an idea. Right. And so I remember sitting there in my office like, oh, like what? I don't even know. Usually... I've been working with him when he's been developing shows and he'll do the character designs, but this was something completely different. It wasn't going to be Family Guy. And I, you know, without really much feedback, <laughs> he wanted it to be adult and sophisticated and not be cartoony, obviously. It couldn't be jokey. Um, and so I stayed up all night watching, like, um, uh, experimental animated films, which I really hadn't been outside the box of my... TV cartoons in many years, right? Um, and got inspired by by a lot of things I saw, and, and then I started to think, well, maybe there is a way to do this that um, is not going to look corny. It's a very fine line to watch, like to walk. It's we had to what we were doing involved like very um, complicated and unique brands of storytelling. A lot of it involves science, explaining science, explaining modern theories of science. Um, and the, the visual style had to be engaging in some way without being a joke, you know, without being a cartoon. And it did have to, 
you know, do the rest of the show justice, which was going to be very, um, you know, um, advanced CG effects. And um, so I, Brent, the guy in the blue check shirt sitting next to me is Brent Woods. He's one of the supervising directors on American Dad, who I've worked with for a very long time. And like the next morning, and I printed out a bunch of ideas for styles and done some sketches and um, I, I, I showed them to Anne and to Mitchell and they were very enthusiastic about the direction. And so I called Brent down and everyone I approached at the project, I did so like very apologetically because it just seemed like I didn't, I was asking people to be, to be involved with me in something that was gonna be very difficult. Right. Um, we had no jumping off point. It was, we were just creating a style of animation and this mode of storytelling from scratch. How, how does that, how do you do that? Like, do you create a color palette first? Do you create a, like... First we, you know, I talked to Brent first and he is a big nerd like myself. So he, and he, he has a big job over on the show. So, but he said he'd be very interested in, in helping me. So he and I looked at a lot of films and um, did a lot of, um, you know, just, a lot of trial and error. Um, the gentleman behind me, his name's his name is Andrew Brandau, and he's a fine artist and illustrator. And he, I've known him for a very long time, and he helped to create. We we wanted to do a background style that um, was going to veer on realism, mm -hmm. um, so the whole show would feel very grounded in realism and the physical, and it wouldn't be. You wouldn't feel like when we went from live action locations of Neil into some cartoon universe. It had to really connect. It had a good transition. Yeah. yeah. So we used, um, what we did is we used a lot of actual photographs of locations and in, in Photoshop and painted over them, but, and used a lot of actual textures and physical effects. Um, Andrew would take photos of textures everywhere with his phone and import them and create these worlds that felt very real but also you know stylized and beautiful and they had to have you know very rich color palettes and, and we went back and forth for a very long time on on the background style and the characters too because you know that's walking a very fine line of m making characters that look realistic and have realistic proportions but don't cross over into that like corny like what Seth and I always call it the Jesus animation, like the Christian um, uh, animated DVDs that are, there are plenty of those out there and they have, right. they try to be very realistic and it comes off looking just kind of hokey. Right. And so coming up with a very graphic style yeah. um, that wouldn't be jarring and that would, um, it wouldn't be like, ah, well now right. we're in cartoons was, yeah. it was, very difficult and you know well I think we actually have some examples of what those meetings led to and uh, I think you guys did a pretty good job of creating I mean look at that I was based on actual painting um, wherever possible we would use um, real things yeah it reminded me a little bit of what, what, what it felt like when I went skydiving. It was just like you're kind of out there and you see the world and like, you know what I mean? And, and here in Los Angeles, you know, you don't get a lot. Like I was really intrigued. I almost felt like I was like in a little bit of like watching planet Earth. Mm -hmm. science class and in the planetarium like all in one you yeah know what I mean and it's like here we, we we very rarely get to see the stars because there's right. so much light pollution right. so it was right. really like it was like a right I love that the planetarium feel that's yeah that's you know that reminds me of my childhood and yeah I did yeah, and like and scenes like this it's not something you could do in anything other than you know some form of animation right um you know and reading it on page you're like okay well we have to make this not look corny. Bruno's flying off into the heavens. Like that right. could go either way. Right. You know, and finding that balance where it is touching, like moving and beautiful and not ridiculous was. Yeah, it's a fine line. Yeah. So. Yeah. And uh, yeah, some of this these. This is one of the first, you know, sequences we did when we were still sussing out the style um, and the most violent <laughs> of them. But you know, one thanks of, for giving me that picture. <laughs> yeah. 
It was Jason Clark, one of the producers' idea to use a, as many real elements as possible. So we use real fire. We do the animation in After Effects, so you're able to import um, physical um, elements, yeah. mist and fire, and um, so we did that as much as possible. Um, That's crazy. And one of the other directors, another fellow is in the picture, is Lucas Gray, who's Seth and I call the master explainer. Is he is um, he just the way his mind works? He is he can break down like if we have a couple pages of some experiment or you know theory of science that we have to explain through our visuals and we can't wrap our heads around it, and he can figure it out how to do. You know the the part in the ep in the premiere episode with the Moses was born five seconds ago. Jim. Yeah. He, he did that whole section, and it was just... I have that in there. I was like, that was crazy. It was like, was... your Moses was born, mm -hmm. your Buddha was born, your Jesus was born, your Muhammad was born, you're all born. Yeah. And I was like, whoa. But that's like, you know, the, the, that cosmic calendar thing is was... That's what I remember probably most vividly, vividly from the first cosmos. And, you know, it's so... It, right. It's such a great way to sort of wrap your head around you know, right. the cosmos in terms of time. Right. And wh why do you think that a show like this, it's so important for it to be like now, like where our, where our country, where our nation, where our world is now in the way that we, you know what I mean? Like why, why now? Um, well, I think because we're at a time when a creation museum in Kentucky was hosting a debate on evolution. Um, and I think it's, you know, maybe a little too late, but better late than never. And they're just, ha you know, right. It, I, I don't understand why it hasn't, there hasn't been a show like this since 1980. It seems, um, you know, it, it, people loved it then. Um, you know, I, the focus back then was more, you know, there were, there were just different issues going on in the world and right um a lot of carl's emphasis was on you know please humanity don't blow up the planet before you know we've gone into space you know right. because that was the very real fear back then and you know now it's um you know science literacy and um just the understanding of things i think it, you know i i get it it's very it's a very uncomfortable thing to try to wrap your head around. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not, it, as I was saying earlier, I mean, it makes you feel like you're going a little nuts when you think about it. But if you, like the science, you know, scientists back in Bruno's time, like, the more understanding you have of it, the less daunting and insane it is, you know, and the less um, panicked it makes you. I mean, Right. Basically, Bruno was like burned at the stake because people were like, panicked. They couldn't understand. What the hell is he right. talking about? But it's it's crazy, too, that like I feel like to this day we still kind of treat people mm -hmm. like that in a way. Like there's some people, like when someone comes with an idea that other people don't understand, they're like, oh, no. They like shun the idea rather than being open to the possibility of, well, maybe I didn't think about it that way. Well, that creationist guy debated Bill Nye. Yeah. He stood up there and listened to what he had to say. Yeah. I mean... I don't, I mean, there's some people, there's some, a part of the population that's, you're never going to yeah. be able to give enough scientific evidence and information to, to change their mind that, you know, that you weren't there, how do you know, you know, and you, there's nothing you can say to that. Right. You're right, I wasn't there. Right. You know, if that, if you believe, you know, in what's written in the Bible and that you're not, you know, yeah, we don't need to reach everybody, but I think there are. A lot of, um, you know, I think I think there's a lot of information, missing information out there that would is be helpful and interesting. To people. Yeah, and I think that too. I think no matter what your your belief is of evolution or whatever, like like the message, like it is visually stimulating. It does explain things. It does give you think more things to question. It gives you more answers. You know what I mean? Like I feel like it's a very engaging. Um, not, I mean, I'm, the word I want to say is lesson, but I know it's not as mm -hmm. a lesson, but it's a le like a lot of people should kind of like at least know what, what yeah. happened and right. know. And for me too, it is kind of bizarre that they, that this was on, you know, 30, 35 years ago 
And then it's like, again, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, okay, you guys didn't get the message the first time. <laughs> Let's do I it think again. I probably did, and, but there's so much time that's, you know, there. I learned so much from the original Cosmos and right. from reading the books um, after that, that, um, you know, and it was so much a part of the zeitgeist back then. Like, right. The, the Evangelist theme music that makes everyone like start sobbing because they remember. <laughs> it's um, it, but you know, it's been so long that there is a whole generation of people, right, that were not exposed to it, and you know, we have some entities out there in the media which hammer away at certain things, um, you know, are that are lies like you know climate change and it right, just right, you know right. it, it's it, so much of our um uh so much of our society is what's being told to us through media right. through the television and computer and stuff so you have but people I, hammering at you saying yeah. certain things you don't know what to believe anymore right and i think too you know in the past 35 years i mean 35 years ago we never thought that there would be a device that we could handheld and talk to somebody in china if we wanted to you know what i mean right. like i feel like it's been such a transforming time period so it is good to kind of like be like hey let's bring it back down to right basics a right little bit. and we didn't have like you know uh, media outlets that were representing, you know, certain interests, political interests and corporate interests that, you know, back in the old days we had news reporters that basically told us the truth. Like it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't it's that become very six, complicated. six companies own all the news and yeah. report what they and want and still the, fear and all that and stuff. And yeah. I have no yeah. idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't either. It's not, not no one I work for. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that, you know, before I get to some of the other projects that you're working on, because in, in a, you do all these crazy, like, lots and lots of stuff, lots and lots of projects, you still crazy to me that you find time to do a blog, you're an avid horse rider, is that true? Or is this stuff that I just found that's, like, lies off the internet, no, too? No, I do, I do, I ride a horse. Yeah? Uh-huh, I have a horse that I keep in La Cañada, which is a few minutes from my house in Eagle Rock. It's a great privilege to be able to do that. I ride him before work in the morning. Um, and I have two blogs that I, you know, don't really have time for, but I, I, I started my blogs because I, at, um, I think it was leading up to the, it was during the 2008 presidential election cycle. And um, Arianna Huffington was a voice on the Cleveland show and she would come and sit and wait for her turn to record and I would sit on the couch and I was like in a state of constant anxiety like a crazy person and I would sit there and just hammer away at her like and I use her as my, my therapist like things that were going on and between the political parties and the fear that you know mm -hmm. the other side was going to win and and one day she said Kara why don't you just write about it and so she gave me a blog on Huffington Post at the time and I and I I did I wrote you know basically use that instead of her to sort of write your outlet and that then at some point you know the a AOL got involved and it, I didn't have the open access. They did some censoring and stuff. And so that, that's when I decided to just switch it over to do a blog. And, um, you know, it, it, it's partially an outlet, but it's also a, um, a way that forces me to stay engaged, you right. know. And I never, I don't like show business, you know, the television business enough for that to be my life like I want to be engaged in other things and it's a way to force me to to, right. to do that and and I believe that the blog is there's two of them right there's mm -hmm. like the teen sleuth mm -hmm. and the library uh, something? haunted library the haunted actually, library the first one I started as it's a um like a book readers yeah blog and but yeah. I don't I, the teen sleuth's a little bit more political yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, 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 I actually enjoyed reading it. I was like, oh, thank Gosh, you. I can't wait to talk to her. There could be a whole other show about politics that we could talk about. <laughs> the book log it, is, it, it's become more so, things nobody wants to read about. Like, I'll talk about my things that I was obsessed with in books when I was like nine. 
you know, like an People object read it. in Little House in the Prairie or something, and it just goes on, and, you know, it's a right. lot of that stuff. So my sister enjoys it because we shared the same experience, but I don't know. Right. Um, and then one other thing that I wanted to touch on, um, there's, there's so many more things I could ask, but, uh, you know, one thing for me, um, and again, I'm not going to, like, try and go all feminist on you, but, like, I feel like what you're doing all your involvement in all these shows, like it's pretty difficult being a woman in these positions that you're in. Like, is there still mm -hmm. a lot of truth to that or do you see it, it changing in the industry or what, how does that Um, all... You know, I... No, I don't really see it changing. I think it is. Um, I'm so... You know, I'm constantly surprised at the level of um, sort of low-level misogyny and that anyone that was accused of it would completely deny and probably not even recognize it themselves right. women and men um but yeah totally I mean, totally it's, yeah it's still there yeah and you know i work in television comedy and it's very male dominated right um and does that affect you are you kind of like oh, it's just the way it is i'm just going to show up and do my job and i know i'm good at it and they want me no, here it, so it it affects me right yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> Definitely like, affects no, me. It affects me. Yeah. Still, it's years not, later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, you know, quite a few of the, you know, if you're a, a woman of any um, uh, authority in, in that world, it's always going to come into play. Right. You know, I mean, it's not, and I don't really, it, it's, it, it is a culture. Right. It's, I don't really begrudge individuals so much because it is a culture that's set up and fed by the entire television system, and I don't see it changing. I know that studios and networks want to, you know, have more women and minorities involved in things, but it's just don't see much happening. Right. So. Well, you know, as long as you keep doing your thing, I mean, you're doing lots of things. You seem happy about it. Um, is there any? Wait, I seem happy. You seem <laughs> happy. You're not happy. You seem happy to. Uh, come on. I don't think anyone's ever said that to me before. Why? I'm like such a misanthrope. No, you see, I mean, I know I've read some articles about what what some other people say about you, but I've enjoyed you. I've enjoyed the time. You seem well, happy. You. You're working on some brilliant projects. I mean, I really think that you know. The family guy in its own way, like it, it, it does, it tests us, it pokes us. We kind of like, it pushes the envelope in a way that that's, it's what's really happening in lives and in families and some people don't want to talk mm -hmm. about it. I feel like American Dad was, it started out to be a little bit political yeah. and then I feel like that kind of tapered off. Yeah. So it's like you're involved in some fun projects, you know, yeah. and then this is something where it's educational. Um, and when I say this, I mean Cosmos. Is it's educational? It's informative. Like I feel like a lot of people are gonna. It's it's gonna cause people to think. And I think for yeah. me, that's that's a happy place when I get to talk to people that are kind of like creating. Like you're creating a reaction almost in a way with with the right. shows that you're doing. Right. It's not just like yeah, yeah. People check Absolutely. out for a half an hour. It's like you're you're making them think. Feel like should I laugh at that? Is that okay? Yeah. Or is this really happening? And yeah, I and think you that's know, a. You're right, and that's I, I am lucky in that in yeah. that regard. There a lot of shows that most people have to work on that are don't have you know don't have that um yeah you know and with cosmos i was ha like um uh it is you know, it's been difficult but it's um it is exciting for all those reasons and um i seth saying to me at the premiere screening the other night he's like you know he was really excited and i had you know i've seen him really excited about something for a long time and he was like it's really huge on Twitter and people really are going to watch it and um, you know and he's like he's like everything you and I have been complaining about for 20 years because you know we complain about certain right Everyone political does. party stuff right. and oh yeah yeah and you know we're finally doing something to make a difference and um, you know it's uh, it's true it's yeah. it, 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 it does you know, makes it more meaningful and makes yeah. it easier to and do I, your job. I think, too, it, it gives it, uh, and maybe I'm wrong in saying this because I haven't ever had a show on TV yet, mm -hmm. but I feel like there's a legitimacy to it, the fact that it's on the National Geographic channel as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like and it's... And that Neil's hosting it. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's not just, like, 
I don't know. For me, when I when I saw initially that it was on Fox and the National Geographic Channel, it's like, oh, because you like in my mind that means like history. Like right. it means like right. it has a certain right. substance rather right. than just like oh, this show on Fox that's going to talk about space right. and the Big or Bang Theory it's also and on Cosmic the Calendar History Channel. Right. Yeah. Right. So I the think Sarah that Sarah Palin show. Right. Oh, don't get me yeah. started on her. <laughs> but, but it's like still like the, the National Geographic Channel still. A real channel, as right. opposed to whatever the nature, whatever the duck people are on, the nature channel, oh, whatever. Oh, yeah. I don't know what those are. but The you duck know. dynasty? Yeah. I don't yeah. know what network that is. It's but. like when MTV turned to TV shows and not music videos. That right. happened to that station. That happened to that station, yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. Is there anything okay. else that you want to let us know that's happening in your world? I mean, Cosmos is exciting. It's another... 13 weeks, is it? Another 12 weeks. So yeah, there's so 12 there'll weeks. be an episode on Sunday night at 9 o'clock on Fox. And then it follows Monday night on National Geographic, right? right. The premiere was just the same day. Correct. And then yeah. it follows. So if you're yeah. busy Sunday, you can catch it Monday. So you people have no or, excuses or not to watch. Or you can set your TiVos or DVRs, whatever. Does that, is that yeah. the, can they do all the ratings on that stuff now? They, they seem to be able to do it. Okay. I have no idea how. Me neither. I have no idea. Can't wrap my head around it. I can't it. wrap my head around that. But, you know, and it was... I mean, I guess. It it's was... got to be transmitted back through. It's one, I don't know. It's one mm. of those things we don't want to know about. Right. It just happens. Or I don't really care. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, you guys can catch Cosmos on Sunday and Monday. Kara, where can people find you got, Find you on Twitter, Me? Facebook? Do you have all that stuff if they want to follow I'm not you? on the Facebook, but um, my I Twitter handle... you said handle... the Facebook. <laughs> That's because you called it the family guy. The, um, it's at Teenage Sleuth. Um, that's my Twitter handle. And my, I don't have, yeah. know what my blog links are right now. Oh, the top well, of my head. I think we have some of them that will come up. Is there any other projects you're working on? Any dream projects? Or like, who's like, leave us with some, like, who would you like to animate? Who'd be one person where you're like, I want to turn them into Oh, a... I am beyond caring who, but I want to animate anymore. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. I do, I work for an organization called the, Compton Junior Posse, where I teach yes. kids to ride and take care of horses. And right. Compton, the suburb of Los Angeles, and um, you can look that up on the internet. It's the Compton Junior Posse dot com, and um, we have an event coming up on May May seventeenth, I believe, a fundraiser event at the LA Equestrian Center. Um, if anyone's interested. What do you do? You get that? to like ride horses if you come? No, you don't oh. get to ride horses, but, um, you know, it's like a fundraiser every year. So we sit down and eat dinner and, oh. but if you're interested in the program, um, then, uh, you can, you can look them up on Facebook or online. And, um, if anyone's really interested in volunteering or participating in any way, um, they can contact them and yes, they can go out to the ranch and ride horses if they want. Sweet. Or watch the kids riding horses. Sweet. Any anything else that I've missed that you'd like to enlighten us with while you're here? <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah, we covered it all. <laughs> See, you're laughing. It's fun. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for watching. You can send in your questions, comments. We can always get them over to you guys um, if someone wants to know specifically about something. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at I am Steph Z. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Nice. That's it. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz, Buzz you later. later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals. Thank you for watching AfterBuzz TV on YouTube. For more of your favorite after shows and interviews, subscribe to our channel here, and be sure to share your opinion on the episode in the comment section below here. We'd love to see what you guys are buzzing about. Thanks again. Buzz you later.